Hi everyone. In this video, uh, we're going to continue with our discussion about prokaryotic cells, bacteria, and their architecture. We've talked already about um, what's going on on the inside. We've talked about the interface between the inside and the outside. Um, we've talked about flagella, fimbriae, pili, very common external structures. And what I want to do now is look at two common, or I should say at least important, internal structures. Okay, and sort of like when we talked about some of the external structures like flagella and fimbriae, we said that it's, it's not universal. Not everybody has these. The same is true here. Not all bacteria can form endospores. In fact, I'll, I'll give you some insight into which ones can. And not all can form what we call inclusion bodies. So let's start, start with endospores. Sometimes we just call these bacterial spores. These are really differentiated cells. So if we think of it as calling it an internal structure really isn't accurate. It's actually a cell inside a cell. So if you look at, for example, these bacteria here, you can see a rod-shaped cell with some terminal, swollen, rounded structure. That's the endospore. That's not so much a structure inside the cell, that's another cell inside the cell. Okay, so it is, you can think of it like the bacteria going through binary fission to split, but instead of binary fission resulting in splitting, the new daughter cell that's formed stays inside the original parent cell, and it's formed differently. It's a survival mechanism. Think of it as like a, an escape pod, okay, of harsh conditions. They're resistant to desiccation, fancy word for drying out, heat and UV damage. In other words, anytime bacteria who can form endospores are exposed really to the sun, where they're going to be drying out, they're going to be getting too hot, and where there's going to be a lot of UV uh, hitting them, they're going to sporulate as a way to survive. What types of bacteria can form endospores? When you're thinking about endospores, I want you thinking gram-positive bacilli, rod-shaped gram-positive bacteria. Among the bacteria that form endospores that cause disease, two genera, right? Genera is plural for genus, that are really important, clostridium species and bacillus species. Okay. Both of these can be found in soil and water, but, but there are species within both of these genera that can, cause, that can form endospores. And we'll talk later in the semester about how important endospores are in the diseases that these two cause because and then in an endospore form, they're impervious to antibiotics and they're impervious to most of our cleaning, sterilizing type techniques. So these spores can be a real thorn in our side when it comes to these bacteria spreading. Now, I don't expect you to memorize this figure here, but I want to talk through the general process of sporulation. Okay, the general process of sporulation, we have a host cell. This is often called the parent cell. So the parent cell, let's say it's a clostridium species. Maybe it's clostridium difficile. You've all heard of C. diff and C. diff infections. One of the biggest problems with C. diff is that it's clostridium and it forms endospores. And so we can kill the, the vegetative parent cell that's actively metabolizing, but once it go, we can kill it with, say, antibiotics or in the autoclave. But once it forms an endospore, that endospore can survive just about everything. Hopefully the autoclave will kill it, but we can't autoclave our patients, so that's, that's a problem. Um, so here we have this rod-shaped or bacillus-shaped cell, and something triggers it to initiate sporulation. Okay? It could be uh, excessive heat. It could be uh, UV irradiation, it could be drying out, or it could be starvation. There's great evidence that shows that when the bacteria start to starve, one way to survive is to form spores and wait for things to get better because you can sit around starving as if you're not metabolizing. Unlike you and me, we have to metabolize continuously to survive. These bacteria can go into a, um, a dormant state for a very, very long time as an endospore. And so essentially these steps are very, very similar to binary fission, except you've got your parent cell that's still there, and the new daughter cell, which has a copy of the chromosome, and it's got its share of metabolites and some, uh, some ribosomes and some things like that, this new cell is in a different form. It's coated in lots and lots and lots of coats of different types of proteins. And what's on the inside is dried down dramatically. In fact, scientists have argued that these endospores could theoretically survive being out in outer space, in the cold, the vacuum, 
where there's no moisture, the pressure's incredibly low, etc. right? And these things could theoretically survive that. Endospores have been found dormant in rock and ice that uh, geologists tell us hasn't been touched for tens of thousands of years. And they've been able to revegetate. So the opposite of this, if you could think of it that way, is when the conditions are good again, this endospore can revegetate. It can lose all these outer coatings of proteins, grow back into a normal metabolizing cell, and get back to life as usual, undergoing binary fission, etc. While it's sitting there as a spore, there's no division, there's no metabolism, but it's also impervious to all of our best efforts to kill it, right? So these endospores can be really, really tricky when it comes to infectious diseases. Okay, the other group that I want to talk about are inclusions or inclusion bodies. These are granules, something you can visibly see deposits inside the cell of mostly either carbon or phosphate. Okay, two of the most common limiting nutrients, right? Just like you and I, if we eat a lot, our body stores the excess carbon as fat primarily. If bacteria have plenty of carbon around when resources are plentiful, they're going to store a lot of it. And the primary way, the most common way they store it, is as a compound called polybeta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a lipid. Um, PHA is polyhydroxybeta-alkanoate, which is just, uh, you could substitute uh, any organic compound instead of butyrate uh, or butyric acid here. But PHB, the butyric acid form, is the most common. So these are droplets of lipids. Just like when you and I overeat, we store fat in our adipose tissues. When bacteria overeat, they can store a lot of that organic carbon as fat droplets that they can use as reserves for a later day. Some will store glycogen, which is a polysaccharide. Others will store um, granules of polyphosphates. Phosphate is sometimes hard to come by, and it's needed in huge, huge quantities for things like making a membrane, right? I'm out of phospholipids. Uh, the ATP cycles, making nucleic acids, all require phosphates. And so if there's lots of phosphate around, the cell already has as much as it needs, some bacteria will just polymerize a whole bunch of phosphates together. And the larger they get, the less soluble they become, until pretty soon you can actually see these granules that we call volutin of polyphosphate uh, inside the cell, so that if there comes a day where there's no phosphate available, they can continue to metabolize, grow, divide, spread, etc. Uh, for the foreseeable future. Those are the inclusion bodies. All right, some take-home points. Some gram-positive bacilli can form endospores for survival. They are resistant to starvation, heat, desiccation, UV irradiation, probably other things, antibiotics. That should be on the list. They're resistant to our best attempts to hit them with antibiotics. That'll come up again later in the semester. And some bacteria store nutrients in their cytoplasm as inclusion bodies.